Hey guys, I'm Davey Wavy, creator of the gay erotic website, Himeros.tv, and today I am joined by sex and intimacy coach, Finn Deerhart, and special guest, sex therapist, Dr. Holly Richmond. And today we are talking about pleasure and sex tech, so let's get started. Himeros Live is supported by Himeros.tv. We are in the midst of our cheaper than Netflix sale. Yeah. Why Netflix and chill when you can Himeros and hump for a limited time? You can get six months of Himeros.tv for just $13.95 per month, which is a 44% discount. Just head on over to Himeros.tv forward slash hump to snag your deeply discounted <laughs> membership today and stimulate your sex life. Finn likes this one. I just love your ad spots. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I really I really put my heart and soul into it. <laughs> you did. You did. Yeah. I'm well, in. I'm on board. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> Our latest member. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, hello. Hello everyone. Uh a warm Himeros welcome to you, Dr. Holly. We're really excited to have you here today. Mm. I'm so excited yeah. to be here. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I think you're our first female guest on our show we've been doing the show for three years how bizarre is that wow oh my gosh now i'm like doubly honored this is amazing this is amazing and i i just have to say i work with finn often so um i don't know if i keep following him or he keeps following me neither of us is called stalker yet so i think we're still good <laughs> awesome you're also so I don't know if this is inappropriate, but you're so beautiful and like radiant sitting here in your little office. So it's very intimidating. Oh, don't be, now, don't be. Start um, doing therapy thank you. you. <laughs> I, I did. And I'm just looking at you guys and I'm like, Oh, youth and these buff bodies. Um, I turned 51 yesterday. So I'm feeling, I'm oh. feeling old. Oh, wow. wow. You look like you're like 38, 39. Yeah. I guess. Good. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. I guess not. Um, cool. Well, it's great to have you here. Um, I just got back yesterday from a shoot, a film shoot that we did for Himeros TV in North Carolina, um, which we'll talk a little bit about, especially in terms of the uh, the sex tech. Um, but my body doesn't know whether it's like mm -hmm. California time, East Coast time, bedtime, nap time, <laughs> snack time. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so please excuse any any loopiness. Um, <laughs> Cool. Well, to give our audience a little background, Dr. Holly, Dr. Holly is a somatic psychologist, certified sex therapist, and licensed marriage and family therapist. This unique combination of professional credentials enables her to focus on clients' cognitive process as well as their body-based health. Dr. Holly is one of North America's leading sex therapists serving women, men, couples, and gender-diverse individuals for relationship and sexuality issues that is quite the uh quite the intro um you've also done a lot of work in sex tech which we're going to talk about in a second but i was kind of curious when i was reading your bio like just kind of growing up how does one become decide to become a sex therapist mm -hmm. like were there were there events in your personal life that were like that kind of nudged you onto this path Yes, absolutely. But it wasn't growing up. So um, this, this is my third career, and it was very much later in life. Um, so I'll give you the, sh the short version. There's the professional version, which is I read a book called True Notebooks that completely changed my life. So it's a, by Mark Salzman, and he went into boys detention facilities in Los Angeles and started teaching creative writing. And I absolutely got a bug up on my ass and I'm like, I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. So I called girls detention facilities around LA and just pretty much said, I want to come work. And one said, yes. So I started teaching creative writing to girls between 13 and 19 in a detention facility in Camarillo, California. Um, and from there decided to go get my master's in clinical psych, then my PhD in somatic psychology Right about that time, my first marriage was falling apart. Um, I don't think I've ever said this out loud before. So you guys will be my first two. Uh, and, and my thinking then was, oh, my, my husband has a sex addi addiction because there was infidelity and cheating and that wasn't our arrangement. Um, so I started studying sex therapy with kind of that addiction model in mind. And then I realized I was completely wrong and fucked up and sex addiction isn't a thing. 
So I've, you know, devoted my career to sex positivity and really undoing shame and, um, you know, normalizing open relationships and non-monogamy, um, you know, it wasn't, that wasn't the deal with my ex. So it was problematic then, but it wasn't an addiction. It was just a relational issue. Mm -hmm. So here I am. Wow. Do, you, do you find that some of those conversations around non-monogamy are, I, I guess my stereotype of straight people is that their relationship structures tend to be like a little bit more traditional. And when we talk about non-monogamy, I think it's because maybe just as gay men, by default, the fact that we're with other men, we're already kind of thinking outside the box of what society tells us we ought to be. Um, but do you find that like these conversations around non-monogamy land in, in the, uh, the straight world, or is that still kind of like a very taboo topic? Both. And I mean, I saw, so I had five clients today and two of those were working on consensual and non-monogamy. One was straight and one was a gay, gay women couple. Yeah. So I'm seeing it everywhere. Um, and I, this doesn't matter, but I'm not entirely straight. So I think that, you know, that brings up extra conversations as well between my, my partner and I, and what that's going to look like. But Davey, to your point, the more we normalize it for straight couples, I think that's the last bastion, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be our strongest holdout. Um, but more and more going there. And what's been interesting to me, it's couples in their 40s, 50s, and 60s mm -hmm. that have been married 30 years and are like, uh, we're bored. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I've had the same yeah. meal for, for dinner every yeah. night for, yeah. for, for 40 years yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm ready for a different, a different, yeah. I, yeah. Once we, once we start seeing like Disney movies where it's like, you know, Disney princess that has like, you know, primary and secondary partner, that's when, that's when we know the conversation fully. Right. Really, Absolutely. Will really shift. Absolutely. And, um, I, I think it, at this moment, it's okay. I want to give a shout out to my friend, Genevieve Lejeune. She's the CEO of Skirt Club, which is kind of bringing like the idea of bi curious women to into parties and in big cities just to give straight women who don't feel exactly straight like oh this is fine like this is all good it's normal like just to bring it more into the social lexicon of what's happening mm -hmm. i love how this is happening across like populations too like the breakdown of just like identity around sexuality and i know that identity is really important to a certain point but then you know we've had Joe on here talking about male flexual, sexual fluidity and hearing what you're describing too. And in the heterosexual world, it seems like the shame is like wanting to express outside of the narrative of the, you know, like the public narrative where gay men, like we talked about this a lot on here, um, gay men kind of come into relationship in, and this is my opinion and it's broad stroke, but they're like coming into it. Like, Hey, I had to fight really hard to like get to this point in my life around sex. You're not going to take it away. But they don't really have always the relationship skills, maybe, and I don't know, maybe heterosexual people don't either, but like to like build a really strong, like nurturing right. environment that they can then branch out in. So that it's just kind of like the seesaw on both sides of strengths on both sides of the spectrum that um, make some aspect of relating difficult, whether that's sex or openness or honesty or intimacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well said. I love that. It feels like we're just like a bunch of teenagers bumbling around trying totally. to find our way. Totally. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God, totally. Um, it also feels like, like this moment, like it's such a unique time to probably be a sex therapist. Like there's so much shifting in our world um, right now, stuff that's coming up, like around examining how race and racism impact our relationships, navigating, you know, a fucking global pandemic, like, you know, I guess my question would be like, what are some of the the things for you and the work that kind of are are coming up right now? Things that you're you're excited about or, or interested in? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, this year has has caused a lot. Um, first of all, just I've never seen more anxiety in couples, and there's really nowhere to run from it, so they've had to sit in it and address it. So I'm actually seeing more conversations around consensual non-monogamy, um, gender fluidity, uh, what sex positivity really means, pleasure, which I know we're getting to today. 
I honestly, there feels, there's a part of me, I don't think people were stopping for two minutes to really think about this because we were all so busy racing from this to this and commuting. And now we've been able to sit in it, whether individually or with a partner and have these hard conversations. Um, from my perspective, it's either kept really like the pandemic has solidified the strong couples and in the couples that weren't going to work anyway, that dissolved pretty in a pretty huge way. <laughs> yeah. 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 It feels like you can't, you can't run from it. Like it's like, yeah, this last year you've, it, it's all caught up with us. Like we're kind of in it, our shit. We Absolutely. are. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's highlighted um, for me too. Something about like, you know, I really prefer things to be really consistent with my partner, but when it's not consistent, it brings up a lot of existential just crisis in me, you know, and I've had to look at that through the pandemic because you live in like living in the same house with him the ebb and flow of connection and not always just even sex, but just like how available somebody can be, you know, and when it changes, like, do, do I react to that? But absolutely around sex, it's just been like, oh, like all those things that I used to like take for granted, like being able to walk home from work and reset myself or, you know, um, just go see a friend and like really feel full and resourced and then come home. I don't have that. So walking outside of my little office into the living room and then my partner there and like trying to find our erotic selves has been really challenging, but I think that we, that we've really learned how to do that more artfully. It's a skill. We're, <laughs> we're, we're also a year, a year into it now. And I feel like as things start to shift again, as people are vaccinated, as mm -hmm. you know, like things start to reopen, there's going to be yeah. another moment of like, okay, it's all going to change again. And we've now adjusted to like, whatever this is. Um, and like, I, I went to get my hair cut today and my barber was like, well, I've been fully, he didn't have his mask on and it was just, you know, him in the shop. And he's like, well, I've been fully vaccinated and so have you. So we don't have to wear our masks. And I was like, ah, ah, I don't, ah. <laughs> I, was like, so, I was like, so triggered by it. And I was like, well, I guess, I guess we can, I guess we can. Can <laughs> Everyone has had to so investigate and dig into their risk tolerance this year. Yeah. And, and Davey, to your point, now we have to do it all over again. Um, but I, I also think for, well, for couples and individuals, we've had to have the conversations, whether it's with ourselves or with each other, because it hasn't been able to be avoided. So for couples that weren't having sex before, and they were using the excuses of, well, I'm commuting three mm -hmm. hours a day, or I'm always mm -hmm. at this person's house on the weekend. Those excuses haven't been there. They've been forced <laughs> to have these conversations about sex. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Um, I do want to chat a little bit about the sex tech stuff. Um, mm -hmm. when we were, when we were emailing back and forth, you said that you're the first woman to write a virtual reality porn for other women, a true, a true pioneer of something very exciting. Yes. I, I think intuitively I know the answer to this, but I'm curious how, like how virtual, virtual reality porn for, um, like a female audience looks different than mm. virtual reality porn that's crafted for for men and then the second part would be like how does having an actual woman write that make a difference yeah that's it's such a good question um and i i want to give the disclaimer that i wrote this for a, a porn company so I wasn't out there writing like this beautiful narrative of like a scene that I really envisioned like this had to it was it had to fit into a certain niche. So um, what do I want to say? There was dialogue, uh, but it still felt pretty porny. I don't even know how else to say it. Like it, <laughs> and, and again, this was the first this was the first foray. Um but it was very much about self-pleasure, but I feel like that's what VR porn for men is too. So only in one scene was there a dude, okay. right? So it was a girl by herself. One scene was a girl, girl, and one scene was girl, guy. There might've been, even been one more scene that was just a, a solo girl. So, so tell me happens, how that, yeah. Yeah, what, yeah. So like what happens in a solo scene? Like, like what's the, the story arc? just her self-pleasuring, her trying different toys, um, touching her body in different ways, just general exploration. That I think that's such a dude question. Yeah. That's such a dude question. So what happens without the dick in the scene? 
<laughs> That's kind of what I heard, Damien. <laughs> yeah, so, so what do women but, do without cocks? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, we. I'm just I, shaking my head right now. Uh, like, Davey, you know about the orgasm gap, right? No. Okay. Um, it pretty <laughs> okay. much renders it, it pretty much renders penises irrelevant. So, so for straight <laughs> couples. For straight couples, when they have sex, the dude will come, you know, 90% of the time. The female will come less than 40% of the time from penetrative sex alone because she needs clitoral stimulation, right? So the VR porn was more about the clitoris, breast play, um, anal play, but it wasn't a lot of dildos because that's not what most women like. Mm -hmm. So so is the idea that the VR porn gives... The, the female viewer kind of a template for like experiencing her own self. Actually, I'm, now as I'm stimulating my <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Does it give them a, is the idea that it gives you kind of a template for exploring your body beyond like what you traditionally are fed in, in mainstream porn? A hundred percent. Yes, yes, yes. Because it's all about the dick in mainstream porn. And then I have mm. women call me and say, I'm broken. Mm. I'm never going to work again. Something is wrong with me. Why can't I come when my boyfriend puts his dick inside me? And I get to say, because that's not how women come. Is he touching your clitoris? And she says, oh, no. I'm like, okay, well, let's start over. Mm. Yeah, let's, let's start from scratch. We actually, one of my favorite YouTube videos that I did was um, uh, real lesbians reacting to lesbian porn. And so I had some of my lesbian friends oh, sit down. Great. Oh, it was <laughs> hilarious. Um, I, I think the video got like 6 million views or 8 million views, but uh the porn that I was showing them, obviously it's, it's lesbian porn that's designed for a male audience and that's written by men, casted by men. Right. Uh, the lesbians in, in it and quote unquote lesbians were probably not lesbians. And there was like a scene where one of the girls, um, she was like licking a stiletto heel and, and then like put the heel inside her mm -hmm. vagina. And the lesbians were like, that has never happened. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, with, with right. Like, no. Nope. Yeah. Like, no, nope. that wouldn't happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's actually never happened mm -hmm. in, in a lesbian, like actual lesbian encounter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know where I see that happening is at a strip club. Right. That's where that would go over really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big hit. Real big crowd hit. pleaser. Yeah. <laughs> Real crowd. With men. With men. Yeah. 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 So there's also this like uh, perception. I don't know if this is true around um, like women kind of consuming erotic content differently that uh, a lot of the content that tends to be favored by a female audience is like written content, erotic stories versus stuff that's more visual, which I think at least the stereotype is that it tends to fall for like a kind of an, to a male audience. Um, is that, is that true? Is that just kind of a generalization? Do we know? I I think it's not true. And I think it's a generalization. Um, I have equal parts, women and men that find the most eroticism through story. Like I literally have one of my clients emailing me right now saying, Hey, do you want to collab on an erotic story app for men? Because I can't find anything I like because oh, wow. he doesn't like porn. Mm -hmm. um, and I know so many women who just love to watch rough sex, someone getting the shit fucked out of them. Like, it's just like, it's, I just, I don't love any of these stereotypes. Um, and I know stereotypes are often stereotypes for a reason. So I'm not saying women don't need more of a story, but, but not all women and some women just like to watch sex. And the stereotypes don't really speak to the mechanism. Like maybe women aren't really expressing that a lot openly because there's an incredible amount of um, judgment put on them for expressing that. Or, you know, it's like, how dare you? You're supposed to want this only in a relationship or something, you know, like. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Or the or porn. Or to be in band powered. Yeah. yeah. Or the porn that's out there being like written, shot, you know, by men is, is like, not something that a lot of women would want to consume. Like it could be like violent towards women. It could right. be like you're saying, it's not about the, the pleasure of the woman that's in the video. So you could also understand like maybe there's this market that's kind of untapped because um, the porn that's out there is, is mostly, you know, made by men. Um, could be an opportunity. It could be. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> I know you guys have your hands full, but yeah, <laughs> so not, probably not another... my expertise. <laughs> That's okay. 
<laughs> yeah. to no one's limit. I'm on, I'm on this podcast with you. Um, and trust me, I was thinking the same thing when I sat down here. I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm going to tell them, but <laughs> here I am. <laughs> So last week, um, I, I shared a story. I watched a VR porn. Um, mm. It was a demo. And it was these two straight uh, cisgender partners fucking in the woods. And it was like a POV video. Yeah. And um, it was I was actually like kind of freaked out by it because well, obviously I'm gay. And in the scene, my partner was a, a, a woman. And <clears throat> I didn't realize, first of all, how like real it was going to feel. Um, like just visually and like the, the sound it, it instantly it's different than watching something. I mean, I can watch whatever and, and feel like kind of indifferent. Um, but it, my body felt like I was there and that wasn't something I expected. And so, um, when my partner, when this woman who had these like long, like, um, mm -hmm. like Swiss miss, like bright, <laughs> like blonde <laughs> braids, she she they were like she kept like leaning forward and they were like swatting at my at my face <laughs> and i kept trying to like turn my head and like and i <laughs> i just had this like kind of visceral reaction to being like oh i don't want to have sex with her um and the cues that my body was giving were like stop but obviously it's just a recorded script so she's not responding to like my body language right. is it like it 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 wasn't traumatic for me but but i could imagine for folks that like i don't even know how to phrase it but like is this kind of immersive experience like could it be triggering for people who are it's so real like survivors of sexual trauma or assault like is there a concern around that there there absolutely is and for some of the earliest platforms where you're just you're an avatar right you're playing in a world where you're an avatar and someone just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming yeah i've heard several stories about this and these platforms had to kind of put up some kind of uh, monitoring system or barrier to stop this from happening but you're right oh my gosh like so i i am not a, a technophile but i got interested in vr porn because to me it's 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 somatic. It's another piece of somatic therapy. So when I first read about it and then tried it, I was like, oh my gosh, here's another brilliant therapy tool to get people in their bodies and out of their heads. Mm -hmm. But it's both, right? Like it's, it can be so real that it, it feels intrusive. And if you're partnered with someone you don't want to be with, that's problematic. But also there would be a learning tool too. If, if, we could animate the other side and you could use your voice and say, say no, or use your body to say no. And she listened to you. Mm -hmm. You know, how yeah. empowering that would be. It? Huh? Have I have tried, you tried it? VR I have not. It was actually, it's hard for me to imagine it feeling when you describe it, feeling like your like your body feels like it's there. I've done, I've done like had like VR goggles at like art exhibits and stuff, but I've not had an experience like this where I felt like, whoa, I'm in this. I'm really, really curious. Yeah. Well, you experience the world through your senses and this like tricks your senses. So but do you feel I mean, the touch, only thing you're... though? Like, can you feel like the sensation of touch? Not unless you have like a haptic suit on. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then you would. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? A haptic suit? A, a haptic suit where you can feel touch. Wow. Yeah. It'll give you a little like. Bzz, bzz, bzz. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Like I think haptic underpants are the way of the future, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are some of the, some of the other things you're seeing in, in sex tech? Um, so it's so hard with the VR because I, so I've been working in VR to, since 2016 and it's, it's, I just keep hearing it's almost there. It's almost there. It's almost there. So I'm, I'm not sure. Like I'm still at this point, not sure, but Boy, is it getting a lot better because when I, I Davey, I don't know if you experience nausea, like that is my problem with VR. Like after you're in it for most people, it's like 25, 30 minutes. They'll start experiencing nausea or motion sickness. For me, it was about 10 to 15 minutes. Like it really, I just didn't, I just didn't feel good in it, but I think that's getting better from everything I've been reading, um, augmented reality. So where you're kind of, you're putting yourself in another environment that might be the next wave. Um, but also I think I wrote to you, you know, I, I've worked with sex bots, um, which was super cool in a therapeutic setting. So who knows? I, I think all of these applications have very specific, um, 
marketplaces that they're filling, right? So it's we're just going to see how it all develops. But I agree with you, the the Finn, you need to try POB VR. Like okay. I feel like that's it's going to be, yeah. Because I want so to. how do I do this? How? Yeah. What do I, Davey? What do you think? Where? What site were you using? What were you doing? What were you on? I went to. Um, I went to like an actual place where they had like uh, where they were like had a setup kind of already created, but um, I think the devices that she was using were probably just things that you can buy, like a VR headset, like you know, consumer available products. Yeah. So a question I have that I think I'm intrigued by this from a therapeutic standpoint too, because it's like, so if you do this in VR, Holly, does it like, do you have like the recollection of the experience being like something that you've lived so that like, you know, for instance, say you have an awareness and then you like go into VR and you practice it where it's maybe less vulnerable than it is with a person in your life um, where you get maybe like really triggered or something. And then you can like have that experience multiple times and be like, Oh, been there, done that and kind of work through the inhibitions. Is that possible? That's exactly it. It's That's practice. Cool. It's, it's body based practice. It's exposure wow. therapy without having to walk across the bridge, get on yeah, the plane, yeah touch the spider, but when we're talking about sex and all the inhibitions that we have there. So that's exactly it. It gets integrated um, wow. because as a therapist, I can only do so much. And Finn, you know this, because I'm constantly looking for body-based therapists to refer people to, especially in the, mm -hmm. in the sexual realm, which is such a fucking gray area still. Like it's, you know, mm -hmm. people are like, really, can I do that? Can I do that? So I thought the the immersive technology would fill that gap for people who weren't quite ready to go see a hands-on practitioner IRL, but where with someone like me, the talk therapy just wasn't getting them quite where they needed to be. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Cause for me, it, it, maybe I was using like a really high, high, like I, it, it was indistinguishable almost from real life for, for me, like having, wow. it was like 360 audio, like it was really, really crisp and clear. Um, to me, it's, I'm, I'm kind of like, well, how is it any different than real life other than that the person's not actually touching you? Like my brain thought she was like riding my dick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I think about it, but, it seems really yeah. cool because like for, I've, I've shared this on the podcast before, like it's kind of hard for me to come from getting a blow job, but like, it's something that I really want to work in, you know, and I feel <laughs> Dr. like Holly's like, thanks for letting me <laughs> know that. Well, it's just kinda, well, I, I feel like I like told Dr. Holly this before. Like, it's, but, I like, know. it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. then you could like, or any, any kind of thing, right. If people have like some sort of like experience that they really want to like work on and you can like have that experience over and again with VR and then you're like, Oh, I see myself in, as having that experience now, and now I can do that. Absolutely. But Davey, you don't have to disappoint anyone or hurt anyone's feelings, right? When in VR, because yeah, I kind of had true. a similar experience to you. <laughs> yeah. The first time I put them on, I was watching it was some cheesy pool party, and this blonde with huge tits, like not my type at all walked up and tried to kiss me. And I went, whoa, bitch, I don't know you. <laughs> so entitled. Yeah. But I backed yeah. up. Like, it's that real. I backed up. Wow. But I could, you know, if if we were doing therapy, I could tell her no. I could tell her slow down. Her feelings aren't going to get hurt. People have such trouble with this in real life. Yeah, yeah except that she doesn't back up. And, like, she's still right, swinging right. her tits in your face. Yeah. And you're, like, yeah. trying to run away from a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't know. Um, we yeah. we just got back from a, a him rose TV shoot I was mentioning in in North Carolina, and we were playing with some like new technology. The biggest piece that we played with was um, this special lens that we used. It was like it looked like like an anteater or something. Like it was this really long lens, and it gives the viewer a perspective of being an ant. There's this whole fetish around like macro and micro, like being really small, mm. being really big. And the lens translates uh, your body into a landscape. So you can imagine it kind of running over your arm. Each From the perspective of the lens, each hair looks like a, um, almost like a tree trunk oh, wow. as it goes across your body. And so as, as someone touches your um you know, say the small of your back, you can actually see through the lens, the trail of goosebumps come up across your body. Wow. And because the lens was so precise and so micro, 
we had to use a robot to to film it. You couldn't actually hold it with your hand because it would have been too too shaky. So our cinematographer built a a, um, a robot that he actually sells to um, production companies, and it's like navigates in three different dimensions. And so he used that to to um, like slide this lens over the bodies of the the guys that we were filming, kind of like dr driving the robot. Yeah. It was so cool and i've never seen i mean are people gonna like come to it i don't i don't know wow. but it's it's creative and we combined it with regular um like a regular lens too so it's not all just in this world of like so close so close but that was pretty cool mm -hmm. that that is um that feels like something too yeah for sure yeah yeah, we filmed a bunch of stuff. We'd had like a love story from World War II. We filmed a video of someone having sex with like their younger self. Um, we did an instructional video with a transgender man. Um, it was it was pretty it was pretty amazing. It was a really um, it was really intense. And right now on our site, we release one video per week. It's kind of like the the flow that we've hit. Um, so it means I do a film shoot every like eight to twelve weeks. Finn has done a ton yeah. of them with us. Yeah. Um, but the goal would be eventually to start releasing two videos a week, but that would mean doing twice as many shoots. And man, like Finn can attest, each of these shoots is an it's an emotional roller coaster. Like totally by the is. end of it, it yeah. totally is. You know, sometimes I come back super like just needing to be off for a whole week and not really talking to anyone. And just why was it intense? Like when when you say it was so intense, what was intense about it this time for you? Um, I think I've said this before. To me obviously I don't, I don't know what it feels like to be pregnant, but <laughs> Dr. Holly, you have, you have kids. Maybe you I do. Me. I do. Yeah. Go if, ahead. Yeah. If you, okay. Here I go. Here I go with my super <laughs> ignorant statement. It feels like, yeah. like a four day pregnancy because it's like, it's spiritual, it's emotional, it's physical, it's psychological, mm -hmm. like it's ticking all the boxes. And, um, I was like, okay, this feels like giving birth to like twins. And one of them is breached and like, <laughs> <laughs> like oh. this is a, a four day labor. Um, it's just, it's also holding this space yeah. for four days and like keeping the train moving. Cause I'm producing it and stuff always comes up. Like things always, you know, people don't get their test results in time. Videos have to oh, get gosh. like, yeah. it's just, it's a lot. Um, so when I come home, I just want to like take an edible, get stoned and like eat pizza <laughs> for, <laughs> two or three days but then unfortunately you come home and you have a full email inbox <laughs> and so that oh, doesn't so that doesn't no. happen and and here you are because i know you just landed so just landed um, last night you don't seem stoned you seem fine <laughs> yeah, I'm not stoned. Yeah. I, I, I will be on saturday so don't text okay. me then <laughs> um uh, so i would like to chat about this week's video which is titled pleasure mapping uh featuring pierce paris and tanner reed dr holly were you able to see the video I was, I was, it was beautiful. So in the video, uh, Tanner, cute little Tanner suggests that they play a sex game called pleasure mapping where one partner touches the um, other partner in different places and in different ways. So the second partner kind of rates how good it feels on a scale of one to 10. So you could like slap someone's ass and they'd be like, oh, that's like a six for me. Um, tickle someone's knees and like, oh, that's a two. Lick someone's toes, that's an eight. There's infinite, like, no, there's infinite ways that you can touch someone, different combinations that you can do. So if you're the giver, the idea is that you would take, I mean, you literally could take physical notes about the things that feel the best or the things that don't feel good. That's also great information. Um, or you can kind of just take mental notes as you go through it. But the idea is after 30 minutes or an hour, I think they do it for just a couple minutes in the, um, in the video, but by the end of it, you would have basically like a blueprint for knowing what feels good, um, for that partner. And if someone's doing it to you, every time I've done it, I've learned new things about myself and my pleasure and what feels good. Um, so I'm curious for both of you, kind of what your take was on the video. Finn, I can kind of, I guess we'll start, we'll start with you. Um, I love the exercise. I think it's a cool idea. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, uh, about the video in particular, I think, was it, who was the one that, who wrote the video? Is this one of Brad's? Uh, Will Tantra. Was one of Will's? Yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like 
those guys, like when they were doing the um, exercise, what I was wishing that they would do is like start describing the stories and what would like why they love those places so much. Because, you know, I'm always wanting to hear that aspect of it. But I'm really I loved what they were doing and sharing with each other. I wonder, like, would they walk away from that and want to know more about each other's experience? You know, like why they might like a certain area more. Um yeah. What do you mean about the stories of, of why? They like, like, oh, I love my feet played with because when I was a kid, I used to, you know, see, you know, guys feet. And that was like, you know, th like those sorts of like associations that really like make our eroticism really, um, I guess, like kind of pop. But um, yeah, that's how I've done the exercise personally. So I think we were just bringing that into it. But I, I was wanting to know more about their personal experiences, but I still think the exercise is rad. Well, you're also like brilliant and like, it, I think for a lot of people, they're like, oh my God, my feet feel good. Like this feels good and my feet are perfect. Right. They're not going to be like, that's because when I was a child. Yeah. Was, you know. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I guess there's like another layer that can be added to it. But yeah, I do think it's a cool exercise and I really, um, yeah, I appreciate you all putting that out there. Yeah. Dr. Holly, what did you think of the, of the video? I, I agree, but I see, like, I was literally kind of in both sides, Davey, um, not that it's a side, but to your point and Finn to your point, because as a therapist, I'm all about making meaning. So I think I was curious of like, what's, because they were saying things, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't really deep. And, and Finn knows, I don't ask the why I ask the how. So I wanted to know, how does that feel good? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what else is happening for you when that's going on? But Finn, sometimes they're the story about why or how someone likes feet and sometimes they just like feet. So yeah, totally, totally, that totally. can be it because sometimes I'll be pulling and pulling and pulling with a client and they're like, I don't know, I just like elbows or I just like <laughs> tongues or I just like whatever. I'm like, okay, that's great. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, I loved I loved this exercise. Um, I do something similar, but build it out even farther. So yeah, so Sensate Focus, it's a little Sensate Focus-ish, right? Do you guys know Sensate mm -hmm. Focus, Masters and Johnson, mm -hmm. giving and receiving and having just communication about that? These two actors did it beautifully. It was filmed beautifully. Um, but for a lot of my couples, gay or straight, um, I build that out. So setting up your room. Um, what would make a dinner more erotic? How could I touch you during breakfast that would bring an, an element of eroticism in like really bringing these moments that were so sexual, but into the day to day. So maybe they're just sensual, or maybe it's that sense of eros or life force and vitality. So just kind of threading that through life. Yeah. There was also an aspect that like, it could have been more, um, and this wasn't, I mean, how the, the concept was written, but that there would be the opportunity for the second partner to make adjustments. So like, yeah, yeah, like that, that feels like a seven for me, but to make it a nine, can you try this or do this differently? Um, which also, it also would have been fun. I, I also, I mean, we, all the time we talk about pleasure. It's, it's in the mission statement for himeros.tv. It's about enhancing your experience of pleasure, connection, exploration, but like, why is pleasure important? Like, it, you know, is it just, well, it, you know, it feels good, but like, is there, like, why is it such a, you know, goal to pursue? Great question. Yeah, it's a great question. And I was thinking about this too, and I didn't know you would ask it. it pleasure is so important to me. Um, so I say with all um, authenticity and honesty, sex saved my life. And it, it is sex, but you know what it really was, was pleasure. So when we deny ourselves pleasure, we're denying ourselves so much. Um, again, that word vitality or vivacity or just drive, desire for more. Um, and I think pleasure is where we can most easily tap into this. Um, and I would love to hear what I was thinking. I wanted to ask you the perspective for gay men and pleasure. Women, uh, it's like... Too many of us think of it as a bonus rather than a necessity. And I really mm. want the world to know pleasure is a necessity because in sex, like so often for straight women, everything is deferred to the male. As long as he's happy, it's supposedly good sex. And that's just not true. Totally. Yeah. I love this. I mean, honestly, I feel like it's a, it's a way of reclaiming like body sovereignty, you know, like authority. It's like, 
I mean, I personally had this experience of being raised in fundamentalist religion and an abusive family. And it was just like, you're not allowed, you're not allowed, you're not allowed. So having pleasure is like a constant overturning of that injunction against it. It's saying like, I matter, what I think about matters, what, what makes me happy matters. It's, uh, it's yeah, taking my body back. I, I can't, I can't speak for, well, obviously I can't speak for all gay men, but I think that, um, at least for myself, sex initially was more about, uh, in terms of priorities, it was more about like getting off. Uh, I think that's probably an experience for a lot of gay men. Um, as I've gotten older in my thirties, connection with the other person, pleasure, these have kind of become bigger priorities for me. Um, I don't know. And it's also about tuning into uh, what feels good for my partner, like t tuning into their pleasure and recognizing that, um, that it's complicated. Every body is different. Um, different people want different things at different times. Th the same person wants different things at, at different times. You know, like sometimes you just want to get the shit fucked out of you. And sometimes that is the last thing that you want. You know, sometimes you just want to gently be fucked. Um, so when I was watching this, I was like, oh, like, you really can't have pleasure without having a solid foundation of communication underneath. Um, and the reason I like today's video is because it gives a very real framework for having that conversation mm -hmm. around what feels good, especially in a situation where like, maybe you don't have this framework with, you know, a hookup. Like it's really hard to have these like honest conversations. And this is like a really scalable, easy way to be like, Oh, let's try this game. And it opens those doors without like sitting down and like having this kind of weird, like, you know, heart to heart where the person's like, look, I really just met you on Grinder 30 minutes ago. <laughs> like, I don't want to look in your eyes. I just came over to suck your dick. Is that what you're right, saying? Right, right. Yeah. 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 I yeah. like what you're saying, Davey. I think that's a, for me, that's what the video um, offers as well as like a way for people to like, let's say they want to connect, but they can't really land in a script at the moment that they're used to, or they don't, you know, like, what do I do? Oh, I have this game and this way to like, then it opened up. It kind of like softened their boundaries. They started talking more, they were playful and it opens the door. Yeah. And, yeah. and, yeah. and, can, and can we recognize too, that like the, I think a lot of us like gay, straight, whatever, take our cues from porn, the world of like porn. And, um, and if you watch porn, like it's not designed to teach you about pleasure or what feels good, um, whether it's for a man or for a woman, like, um, so I think this is a, this is a fun, a fun video. Mm -hmm. No, I, I did love that too. It didn't feel performative, um, which I think is pretty much what you just said. Like it was so pleasure-based and so about communication and them being honest with each other. It didn't feel particularly performative. And I just realized when I was thinking about it, they both felt like they deserved pleasure. They both felt to me like they believed that they deserved what they were receiving, which is a really beautiful thing. The director's commentary on this is that we filmed this like one week before lockdown last March and okay. that everyone, mm -hmm. it was on a film shoot. Like the world was like suddenly shutting down. Two of our models were from Canada. They were like, am I going to be able to get back? Everyone was like refreshing CNN to see like what was happening. Um, it was like this environment of like such like massive anxiety that everyone was having. Um, and I think something that at least initially for a lot of us happened with the pandemic was like, we went into survival mode and the idea of pleasure, it seemed like such a luxury, like it was just kind of put on the back burner. But I think what a lot of us have come to realize is that um, it's pleasure is very powerful. It's healing um, at times, you know, like what we're going through it's actually a, um, it's a powerful tool that we can use. And so while the, you know, the knee jerk reaction might be like, okay, putting it on the back burner, I don't need this right now. You probably need it now more than, more than ever. Absolutely. Yeah. And just helping people identify where that, those pleasure pieces have been over the last year plus now and finding yeah. it in sex is really, it's just been so beautiful for, for a lot of people. One of the videos we filmed on uh, the shoot in North Carolina uh, was with a porn star named Luke Hudson, and he's a, a trans guy. And he told us that when he hooks up, he has to have a conversation with the guys that he's fucking because a lot of them have never had sex with a vagina before. So 
like just for his own safety and his own pleasure, he needs to kind of storyboard the sex that they're having. Um, because if all they've seen is porn, then they think like, okay, yeah, like there's no conversation around clit. It's just like, fuck it as hard as I can. And um, it was when he was sharing this with us, we we're like, wow, how exhausting and unfair it is that every time you want to have sex with someone, you have to like sit down and like have this conversation. Um, so our goal in, in filming um, the video that we did, we filmed him having this conversation with his, with his scene partner and kind of walking through the sex mm. and um, you know, and obviously every trans man is going to be different as well, but it, it kind of gave this framework for how actual pleasurable sex um, uh, can, can look like. And, and so rather than have this conversation every time, he, I mean, you probably still will, but he could send like a link to the video and be like, here, <laughs> yeah, really watch this first, <laughs> like save some of the conversation. Yeah. So I don't know. That was kind of fun. Yeah, it was. If, yeah. If you want, I think we should all have that. If you want to fuck me, watch this video. Here's your homework. Mm -hmm. Totally. <laughs> Totally. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a dating here's profile. My, here's my reel. Requisite. Yeah. Here's my reel. Yeah. Reel. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the, the, yeah. The, that, yeah. I, I, that's a really fun idea. Um, okay. I just want to read one of the comments on the video. This is Xavier 949. Dr. Mm -hmm. Holly, he writes in every week with these like <laughs> lovely, lovely comments. He wrote, wow, that was an interesting concept. Intense tension buildup. The lighting techniques are <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> the lighting of the scene was warm and inviting and a nice background. People like to comment on the, oh, on I, the I don't know whether it's like the ul ultimate like compliment or not, but people like to, to comment on the decor. I'm like, yeah, but also the sex, right? <laughs> the sex. Um, I've never seen a ball sack that can stretch like pierces. Amazing. It's so hot to see two dicks being masturbated and sucked together. I like the way the penis heads were given emphasis. Tanner should give us lessons how to condition your body for self-sucking. I've always wanted to be able to suck my own dick, um, but that isn't possible. To be masturbated by another guy is so intense and relaxing at the same time. Uh, I was curious about Pierce's orgasm. It was intense and a 10, as he said, but I did not see any ejaculate at all. Did Tanner just completely swallow it or was it an intense dry <laughs> orgasm? I don't, I don't remember that. Um, it is funny that we didn't mention, yeah, there was a lot of ball stretching and Pierce, the, the model who has the really stretchy balls, he, um, he puts his balls up his own butt uh -huh. mm -hmm. and then likes to get fisted um, or sometimes will put his balls up his butt and then fuck himself because he also has like this gigantic, gigantic penis. Yeah. That's a gift. That that is like yeah. <laughs> that he's, is. He's he's fan he's fantastic. He's just that's fantastic. Um, is this? I'm just curious. Would yeah. this be fetishized, or is it just like holy shit? I want to be that dude. What do you think, then? What do you mean, like for Pierce himself, or for like there is a no for people watching for, that. for your audience. Yeah. Would they fetishize him and, or would they just be like, that's amazing. So cool. I want to be him. I, I feel like our audience would be just kind of like, oh, that's really cool. And kind of wouldn't necessarily fetishize it. Um, but I don't know. Davey, what do you think? I think they would fetishize the size of his dick. Yeah. I, I think people would be like, whoa, like that's like, <laughs> <laughs> they make that sound when they press play. Yeah. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> when when Tanner came onto the porn scene, his like big thing was that he can self suck, uh -huh. uh, and so we wanted to incorporate that into this video. It's kind of a gimmick, right? But it's not actually comfortable for him to do it because it's like that, like that's that posture. It's, it's not you know, comfortable it's, for anyone. <laughs> I don't know that it's, it's comfortable not. for anyone. Maybe I don't know. Uh -huh. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Like it might give you scoliosis. Like you're like you know hunched over like this. Uh, but in terms of cinematography, I mean, it looks really cool. It's, mm -hmm. it, it looks, it looks fun. Um, oh, we do have one other comment that was of note here. Uh, Iconoclast2222 says, oh, I wish that he would suck my low hangers. So. Well, there you go. It is fetishized a bit. <laughs> yes, there we go. I actually love Tanner's, like the way he like, w uh, speaking of feet, he like he's wiggling his toes when he was jacking off and kind of his feet just kept like flexing and moving. I thought that was so cute. I love that. Yeah, 
yeah, Tanner was a sweetheart. And also like keeping in mind that the, the pandemic was just like, it was just, I really appreciate them showing up and being like, okay, we're going to do this. Like, yeah. let's knock this out in the midst of what seemed like the end of the world at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree with the first person who wrote in about the double, the penises together, masturbating together. I thought that was so beautiful. I thought that was so beautiful. And it was, again, there, it, I don't know if it was how it was shot or just how their energy, um, it felt sensual. Like it was just sensual, sexual. They were communicating. The energy was great. And yeah, Davey, sorry, the decor was spot on. So <laughs> That wallpaper just <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> We put a lot of thought into location, though. You know this. This is not like... (laughs) Yeah. These are not hotels on the side of the road. (laughs) Yeah. This was shot in Joshua Tree. We rented this really cool space. And it actually wasn't wallpaper. Someone had... An artist had actually cut those shapes out into the wall, painted them gold. Like, it it, it really... It was... Yeah. It was pretty special. It's super cool. Yeah. Um, Okay. So a little note for housekeeping. I just uploaded a YouTube video for the audience to check out. It's the Don't Get a Boner Challenge. (laughs) Featuring the Robocock sex toy. Um, spoiler alert, the guy does get a boner, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, if you want someone to not get a boner, tell them, if you want someone to get a boner, tell them not to get a boner. Right. And they'll get a boner. If you, if you don't want someone to get a boner, tell them to get a boner. This is, this is like the story of every film shoot that we do. Um, it's like as soon as a model feels pressure about getting hard, totally. then they don't get hard. Um, and I get excited over that because I, I really want to normalize in our films models, not always being rock hard. Um, the flip side of that is models often tell us like, okay, that's great. But like, I don't want to be the the model that has like the soft dick in the video. Like, I don't want to be the guy, like the pioneer of the, the soft cocks. Um, oh, I work with erectile dysfunction like almost daily at this point this year. And I think because I'm anxiety, like this can't be a coincidence that I'm getting more erectile uh, dysfunction than ever since the pandemic started. Um, so Is all it right, even- Davey, I'm, yeah, I'm going to say that next time. Um, pretty much sensate focus. So, you know, what was in the video, the sensate focus protocol, I use it for erectile, erectile dysfunction all the time because it's not about the stiff dick. So I literally say, no one's fucking anyone until I say you can. And that's like six weeks from now. So just forget it. Like, it's not happening. I don't care what your dick's doing. Not important. Yeah. Yeah. And is it even erectile dysfunction? Like, maybe in the same way that we talk about, like, sex sex addiction. Like, Finn's like, oh, like, it's not really. Like, maybe that's just, like, how dicks operate. Like, you know, they're not always hard. It is. It it is. I just, I didn't know how else to say it so people could know what I was talking about. No, it's just anxiety. Sex addiction is anxiety, a penis going off too soon, not getting hard. It's all anxiety because these guys that I'm talking with, when they masturbate, guess what works just fine? (laughs) Right? (laughs) Their penis. So there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's only wrong in context of another human being. Mm-hmm. We had um, in, in our uh, shoot in North Carolina, one of the models um, wasn't getting hard. And, and we did a, a remake of The Shining. We did like a, a, like a gay porn version of The Shining. This is what happens yeah, when you get like a house full of queens. Yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> and, and so he wasn't getting hard in it. And so what he would do is he would step out of the scene and start jerking off, like w- pull up his phone, watch some porn to try to get himself hard, like to build up a, you know, a charge. And it was it, it immediately shifts all the energy in the room. And like it, it's it's not conducive to like what we're trying to create or film. And so in his next scene, my note to the director was like he was, again, supposed to top. He was supposed to fuck. And I was like, how about, uh, it was a threesome. I was like, instead of him fucking, like, how about he holds space for these guys? Like he is sensual with them. He connects with them. He touches them. But like, we can take fucking off the table so that he's not stepping out, getting on his phone. And, and it was a, as soon as we gave him like that freedom and like, yep, you're not fucking anyone. Not only did he get hard and calm, but we had this like beautiful, beautiful, sensual, sensual scene. Um, so we do have some questions and one of them is, is, uh, about VR porn. So I want to ask yeah. this yeah, because we have, you know, we have an expert right here. So, um, if you guys have any questions at home, you can, uh, email them to Davy at DavyWavy.tv, or you can call or text 612-470-5729. 
Last week, you guys talked about virtual reality porn. My partner and I are monogamous, and I'm not really interested in an open relationship at this time. Hearing Davey describe his situation with the virtual reality porn video, I wondered if it is considered cheating because it's so real. Would I be cheating on my partner if I watched a VR video? Oh, Oh, this is such a good question. Uh, Would you have to keep this a secret from your partner? If you do, then it's cheating. Like if you feel uncomfortable about uncomfortable about it, then it's cheating. But it wouldn't, I mean, to me, the answer is no, but who cares what I think? Like it has to be within that couple, right? So what would be the risk in sitting down with a partner and saying, hey, I'm curious about VR porn. What do you think? Because there are people who consider watching porn cheat. I mean, not people that I know, not people that I want to be friends with, but there are people who think that like watching porn is cheating, right? So you, you can't even imagine. Can you, I mean, you're getting a sense of me right now, but when I have couples come to me and say he cheated on me, I caught him watching porn. You can just imagine like the, the facial expressions that I'm holding back. And I'm just like, okay, okay. If it's a secret, you know, we all deserve privacy. Secrecy is another thing. Secrecy creates shame, breeds shame. And that's, you know, that's going to cause problems. Um, I don't think it's cheating. I'm going to definitely go on the record and say it's not, but I also am a huge advocate for open communication and let's talk about this. Ben, what do you say? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a really, there's like the coach aspect of me, which is like, okay, so let's identify what's hard and let's find a way to work through it. You know, like, cause it's like not a win-win situation if you put it away or, you know, if you like don't do what you want to do because you're concerned about your partner's feelings then that's not going to be helpful for you in the long run either. But your partner's feelings do matter. So we need to kind of unpick like, what is it about, you know, what is, what does he need? You know, so just wanting everybody to like get what they need. <laughs> like, like what does everyone need and how can we work through that is kind of where I go. Um, so I don't consider it cheating unless there, you know, in any situation, unless there's like an agreement and, and you know that that agreement, you're representing it to be one way and then you're doing another thing. And for whatever reason that, that, you know, that hurts people's sense of trust. Um, and they're, you know, can they rely on you? That's really the question. Like, can I rely on you in relationship to like, keep me informed? Um, but it's really complex, you know, cause I mean, the partner's thoughts are, are what they are too. And they, they, they just need to be explored in a way. It's a good coach answer. I'm like, if that's cheating in your relationship, like get into a new relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it could be like this amazing opportunity for both of them to really grow in a way that they probably want to anyway. I really believe that, you know, like, that's no, been... I know you do. That's lovely. <laughs> that's, that's why we love you. Ben. Yeah. That's why we love you. But I mean, if, if to me, if a person is afraid of their partner watching porn, I'm immediately going to zero in on that person and figure out what the hell the insecurity is about. Mm -hmm. And I will ask, I'm like, I mean, so they've probably been cheated on uh, almost hundred percent. They've been cheated on right in real life. So not being wanted, not being the primary focus of attention by their partner. um, All those things come up and I agree with you, Finn, they need to be worked through, but I'll, I'll like dig it down. I'm like, so, so really if your partner's watching porn, what is your fear? Or is your partner going to meet the porn star and go off and have this fabulous life without you. It's like, is that literally going to happen? And they're like, well, no, but bah, 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 bah. Yeah. <laughs> so we just get to pull it all apart. Yeah. Like your partner watching porn has nothing to do with you. Right. Like you don't need to make this about when, when I was in an open relationship, one of my ex-boyfriends loved like Pierce Paris dicks, like the, mm-hmm. like the, the video that we saw yeah. uh, that we we're just talking about. And, and I had, we had an open relationship and I would always, Initially, I, I had these like knee jerk reactions of like, oh, my God, my dick isn't big enough for him. Like he needs like 10 inches of cock and I can't I can't do that. And he was like, honey, like I love you and me loving you has nothing to do uh, like about your penis. Like this is I love you. And I also enjoy riding 10 inch dicks. And so like, don't make this about you. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh OK. okay. <laughs> like, oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah, Both things about. can be true. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, cool. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Holly, for 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 being here with us. This was a really fun conversation. It was such a treat having you here. Totally. I I loved it. Thank you for for having me, Finn. Thank you for making the introduction, Davy. It's been just lovely being here with you for an hour. 
Yeah, thank you. If people want to find more of you, um, learn about your practice, where can people go and, and how can people get more info? Yeah, and your book. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and my book. Okay. So my website is just drhollyrichmond.com. So it's D R H O L L Y R I C H M O N D.com. And all of my social is just at Dr. Holly Richmond. Again, D R, not Dr. Written Out. Um, I have a book coming out in October for survivors. It's called Reclaiming Pleasure, a sex positive guide to moving past sexual trauma and living a passionate life. So, um, so much of my career has been working with survivors, um, and this idea of healing, which is great, but I, I really want everyone having great sex. So that's what this book is about. Awesome. And Finn, where can people get more of you? FinnDearHeart.com, F-I-N-N-D-E-R-H-A-R-T.com. And if anyone, because people have been emailing me about those other reflective journeys we did, if somebody wants a pleasure map that I've put together that I use for my work, email me. I'm happy to send it. It's got some, and it's going to ask you questions about why and how you like stuff. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And next week we are discussing Every Cut is a Lie, possibly my favorite video that we've ever filmed. And remember, you can join Himmeros.tv and save 44% off your six month membership at himrose.tv forward slash hump. It's just $13.95 per month. Thank you guys so much for listening. And as always, more to come.